we think that there will be a global collapse of the economic system, um, either driven internally by decades of broad money growing so much faster than GDP, and or a, a major conflict between the new world and uh, the old world of the Western Alliance. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder, Adam Taggart. In this interview, I talk with Simon Hunt, one of the world's foremost experts on the copper industry. Why copper? Well, because copper is often referred to as Dr. Copper, given its ability to predict turning points in the global economy. Due to its widespread use across nearly every commercial sector, demand for copper is akin to the economy's heartbeat, which is why it's viewed as such a dependable leading indicator of economic health. So what is Dr. Copper telling us now? Well, I asked Simon this question, and his answer is one of the best, most comprehensive, detailed, and actionable predictions I've yet heard on this program. So let's just get right to the interview. Simon, thank you so much for joining us today, all the way from Dubai. Well, thank you for having me. It's a great honor. Oh, well, you're very kind. I've been looking forward to this, uh, this interview very much. So let's jump right in, Simon. But first, let me start at a very high level with a question I like to ask all my guests. What is your current assessment of today's global economy and financial markets? I guess that was the question you were going to ask first. Um, we really have to center around what's going on between Russia and NATO forces. And my take is that we can well have a temporary cruise, truce, but that it's not going to resolve the big issues, which is really less about the war in the Ukraine and more about the relationship between America and Russia and China. Because what Russia and China are starting to put together is what I call a new world, not President Biden's new world, but a world in which China, Russia, and most of the BRI countries uh, want to establish a, an economic and currency framework that does not include America and its allies. So it's against that background that I think that we might, as the reports are coming out to suggest, we could have a temporary truce. I don't think it's going to lead to peace. I think that uh, adversity will break out again, maybe by the middle of the year. So against that background, uh, we'll have probably rallies in metal markets, uh, rallies in equity markets. Um, so we can see uh, copper in this short period of time, maybe over the next month, rallying to about $11,500, which is about in round numbers, $1,000 higher than today's prices. And then we get, uh, we, we get a situation where peace is not forthcoming, that uh, conflict restarts. And at the same time, uh, Russia, China, et al. unveil their new currency arrangement and economic um, uh, arrangement. 
So we get very sharp falls in uh, global equity markets, very sharp falls in uh, metal markets, with copper down to probably somewhere between 7,700 and 8,000. And it's at that juncture with weak global activity, probably the world basically flatlining with some countries either in recession or looking as though they are approaching recession, that Western central banks then forget about QT, revert back to QE and to um, uh, no longer considering raising interest rates. So that by year end, we have recovery, but we have recovery accompanied by, by inflation, which by sometime around 2024, will approach the levels that we saw in late, the late 1970s and early 1980s. And in that environment, we will have the US dollar falling very sharply. In fact, uh, our technical associate has been saying for some time that the US dollar index by the mid 2020s will have halved in value. So you can see that uh, metals and other commodities like copper um, will be rising very sharply. So take copper as the example. Uh, we see a spike in copper prices towards the end of 2023, early 2024 of around $14,000. Now, uh, what follows is, is a collapse, as we see it, of the global financial system with asset prices falling to the sort of, sort of rates that were experienced in 1929, 1932, and therefore copper and other commodity and metal prices will um, collapse also. And if, one, right. is taking, if one is taking it a stage further, what this um, leads to is a world of multinational currencies and a world where Debt is not the driver of growth, but equity. And then we can see for the next 20, 30, 40 years, global GDP averaging the sort of growth rates that it has experienced in, since 1900, namely around 4% a year, compared to the anemic 2 to 2.5% 2 of the last 40 years. All right. Well, Simon, that was one of the most detailed um, and uh, uh, really compelling in a little bit of a terrifying way <laughs> answers <laughs> that I've ever heard on this program. So thank you. Well, you um, did invite me. <laughs> I, no, I did. And this is exactly what I was looking for here. Um, let me, if I can, briefly recap to sure. make sure that I followed you correctly here. Um, you basically said that, uh, I'm going to start in the short term here, uh, that uh, sort of for the, the, in the near future here, um, you think there's decent potential that there might be a temporary truce uh, in the war in Correct. Ukraine. Um, it's not going to resolve the big issues. Uh, and we're going to start to see coming out of that, uh, Russia and China and perhaps some of the other BRIC companies um, beginning to pull away. It's going to become more of a multipolar world than it's been before. There's going to be new trade relationships uh, struck coming out of what's happening right now. Um, I sort of liken that as a, a, as a, a change from you know, a couple of decades of, of increasing global cooperation to maybe we start seeing more global competition 
coming to the right. forefront. Yeah. Um, in the near term, as that happens, you think that we're going to see, you know, rallies, relief rallies from the troops, et cetera. Um, but as, as that peace begins to break down, as China and Russia re reveal those new trade routes, we're going to see um, very sharp falls, um, both in asset prices and also specifically to your area of expertise. Um, you're going to see copper, kind of the heartbeat of the economy, go from about 11,000 a ton to about seven to 8,000 a ton. Um, you think that, that it's going to lead the global economy to then stagnate, flatline, I think was the term you used. We're going to see some countries in recession. Um, that's going to force the central banks to come back out and pivot from quantitative tightening back to quantitative easing. So by year end this year, 2020, you see us being in recovery. But I'm going to put recovery in, in air quotes here because it's really um, one that's just being juiced by the short-term return to stimulus. That's going to be paired with high sustained inflation to the point where you think by 2024, we're gonna see the same type of persistent high inflation that we had in the late 70s, late 80s. Um, that is then going to trigger the US dollar index potentially cutting in half, I believe you said, by the middle of the 2020s. Um, that will send metal prices higher. That's gonna be part of all this inflation we're talking about, but eventually that high inflation, slower economic growth is going to lead to a collapse of the financial system. Uh, you said asset prices sort of in the depression era, you know, great market crash that we saw back then. Um, <laughs> I hope I'm getting all this right. Um, yeah, they're doing well. And, and you, you made a comment I wanted to just drill into here. You said um, <clears throat> uh, debt is no longer in, in this new environment uh, by that point, debt will no longer become the driver of economic growth. It's gonna be more the equity markets. Um, returning to say like 4% GDP growth, which of course is higher than what we've been seeing in the past decade plus. So in that process, what happens to the huge debt overhang we have right now? Is this the clearing event where a lot of those bad debts just it finally basically default? Is washed out? Okay, so, so that the, the massive- It gets washed out and the zombie companies uh, collapse um, as interest rates are- with central banks reluctantly raising rates, but the market is doing it for them. So you will have, I mean, we've got um, inflation running at more or less the same levels as they were in the late 1970s. So from memory, you're talking about 13 and a half percent CPI in America. Um, what, are, what are rates going to be? They're not going to be what Volcker would have done, but they're going to be right. They'll rise enough to cause mayhem in, in, in asset prices. Okay. Okay. So um, there's a lot of people who watch this, the videos on this channel, <clears throat> who I think look back at the policies of the past several decades with a lot of frustration that uh, feel like, okay, there's been an increasing amount of central planner intervention that has distorted markets, that has created asset price bubbles, that has created um, historic wealth inequality, and has um, brought the system to an unsustainable state where some kind of a big corrective event is probably likely at some point. And they're, they're almost, rooting for it at this point. And it's not because they want people to be hurt, but make it akin to climbing a ladder, right? The higher you go up on the ladder, the harder and more damaging the fall the is, the right? Fall. Yeah. 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 And they feel like we, we keep getting higher and higher and higher. And they'd rather fall now than fall, you know, from 2x this height later on, right? So it looks like you're, if I'm interpreting this correctly, you're seeing that clearing event happening at some point in the mid 2020s. Uh, is Correct. that accurate? Yeah. I think it starts 2024 on our timing. Okay. Which, you know, sounds a long way away, but it's it's, it's not less than two years now. <laughs> two <Yeah>. years. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, look, I had a whole bunch of questions for you, which you've kind of already answered here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but let's, um, so let, let me, let me, let me shift into this then. F first, 
let's maybe talk a little bit more specifically about how the chessboard is changing right now. So, um, you know, the U.S. has really pushed back on Russia's um, invasion of Ukraine, and they've done some things that I think they, the U.S. and the West, have done some things that I think have surprised a lot of the other geopolitical players, right? Like um, uh, seizing Russia's uh, foreign reserves, right? And I think the extent of some of these uh, global trade embargoes that are being put in place against Russia. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts, but my, my perspective is that uh, you know countries out there are saying, "Wow, I didn't really think the U.S. would ever take measures like that." And and while I might be in the U.S. as good graces now, I might not be tomorrow, <laughs> and therefore I don't want that to happen to me. So I'm going to start accelerating my plans to de-dollarize here. I'm going to create you know more trade relationships so that I'm less dependent upon the U.S. and its key allies. I see you nodding as I'm saying this. Um, but can you talk a little bit more specifically, because I know you're very close to what's going on in China, as I mentioned in the introduction. Um, what are the things that are going on right now that you think are um, catching the attention of those companies the most? And what are some of the steps you're seeing beginning to be put in place that you think will have the most significance going forward in this new sort of multipolar world that you're describing? I, I think we should, <clears throat> before looking specifically at China, we should look at what the Eurasian economic uh, group is doing, which includes China, in creating a new currency. And according to the reports, the currency will be a weighted average of member countries with the reference currency being the one, but linked also to the commodities that they produce. What was not mentioned in the communique, which I found interesting, was that Russia and China between them based on our sources actually own something of the order of 54,000 tons of gold, of which in round numbers, 12,000 is owned by Russia, which makes a great difference to the media reports of an imminent Russian collapse. So against that background, uh, what's going on in China? Um, first of all, China has been preparing for the coming conflict. I suspect China knew what Russia was going to do back in November, December, because they changed the way that they ship goods from Russia into China, from CIF to FOB. So that as soon as the freight is on board, it's owned by China. Um, so what the other headwinds, which, which are quite big ones, that face China at the moment is one, exports are going to fall, and exports have accounted from memory something of the order of 26, 27% of China's GDP. Real estate, uh, which Beijing engineered the bankruptcies that have taken place as a means of taking <clears throat> the, the, the power of the play in property 
away from local governments and uh, the real estate developers. And they'll come back into the hands of central government as SOEs will buy up these assets at very cheap prices. So, sorry to interrupt. When you say SOE, you mean state-owned enterprises? State-owned enterprises, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I was told a couple of years ago, uh, so it was before this plan actually was unveiled, that the big railway construction companies would become real estate developers by building towns and cities wherever they have a station so that the control of the property market will be taken away from the highly leveraged private sector real estate developers into the central government thus being able to, um, to flatten out prices by when they see the market tightening, increasing the supply and vice versa. I mean, it's quite interesting. There was a report written by a well-known um, economist who actually said that over the last decade or so, the uh, amount of unoccupied building was, I think, something like, I can't remember exactly, something like 20% of the total in a period when prices were rising sharply. <laughs> so that's a, that's, that's a, a headwind as a second headwind for China. A, the biggest headwind in, in my view is the rising geopolitical tensions. Because what struck Beijing was the act that Biden passed on the 27th of December last year that effectively makes Taiwan one of the militarized countries surrounding China. That was a big red line. So I think you are going to see a much more aggressive attitude by Beijing towards America over America's policy towards Taiwan. Okay, lots to dig into there. Let's start with Taiwan just for a moment because we can perhaps draw some parallels between Ukraine and Russia, um, where Ukraine is a territory that has had lots of close ties to Russia. And one can possibly explain what's gone on recently there is, is Russia finally stepping in and saying, Look, we're protecting our interests, um, both because we don't, you know, NATO on our doorstep, something we won't tolerate. And there's these regions of, of Ukraine that really want to be part of Russia. And we're finally just going to step in and kind of correct everything. Uh, you could potentially make the argument that China, you know, wants to do the same with Taiwan. Um, if, if there is a peace here, hopefully soon uh, in Ukraine, um, and let's say Ukraine ends up being divided. You know, right now there's there's been some articles in the past 24 hours about how, uh, you know, Russia is going to keep the Donbass and Crimea and a few other uh, parts of Ukraine and, and let Ukraine keep the rest. Um, does that almost kind of give China a little bit of a green light if, 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 if once the dust settles from that, that's how the, the world map looks, where China could say, well, Russia did this and they end up kind of getting away with it. Time for us to take Taiwan back. I... I... I don't think that Beijing wants to attack Taiwan. 
it will only attack Taiwan if there is absolute evidence, overt evidence that Washington is going to encourage a referendum for independence. That's the big red line. If Washington doesn't cross that red line, then I think that the leadership in Beijing believes that time will be a healer, that they will find compromises that will allow both to live together. And one goes back to what Deng always or did say, 2028 was the year when things will happen. So bottom line, and it, I, I, I don't, China doesn't want to invade. They will only do so if America crosses that red line. Okay, so it sounds like you're sort of saying just as Ukraine potentially becoming a NATO member was the, that was the red line that Russia couldn't stomach. Uh, you think that they'll, they'll have a, a policy of patience towards Taiwan unless uh, the US pushes for independence and then that's when they're gonna say, look, that's just something we can't abide. But I think that the situation in Ukraine is a little bit different because Russia has been saying for years, you NATO have been encroaching on our borders. We have warned you that this is unacceptable, but you did not heed our warnings. And therefore the time had come when we, have to, we had to make a stance. It's not just Ukraine, it was, it is securing their borders. Okay, okay, so I, 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 I'm gonna dig on the China thing just a little bit more with you. So um, uh, regardless what happens with Taiwan, I guess Taiwan would sort of be a massive accelerant if, if, uh, sure. if China actually sure. militarily tried to, to, to go and, and reintegrate it with force. But let's assume for a moment that that doesn't. Let's play out the, the timeline that you mentioned earlier. Um, where by, you know, kind of the mid 2020s, kind of the whole world is feeling a lot of pain, right? You talked about the headwinds that China's facing. Um, you, know, you talked a bit about the real estate market. Um, as I understand it, the Chinese real estate market is the largest asset in the world, <laughs> the largest single uh, asset class in the world. Um, yeah. and, and whether that's true or not, it's got to be very close. So um, if I heard you correctly, you know, you said that, you um, kind of the Wild West atmosphere that's been going on there right now, the state is trying to wrangle control of that and begin to move oversight uh, of the, the real estate market from the speculators um, to more of a central government controlled yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. approach. But, but anyways, given all those headwinds you mentioned, you know, if, if the rest of the world is in recession, going through kind of depression era um, asset class corrections, China is not going to be immune to that. Um, my question for you is... But, but, but yep. if I can just interrupt, Absolutely. China has been preparing for it. Okay, great. So we're, we're heading They've to my question. They've been preparing for it for at least two years. Okay, great. I want you to give some detail on that. And the question that I want to ask you is, is when this happens, <laughs> um, uh, how do you see the various world powers kind of emerging from this? You know, who, who's going to emerge better, faster, et cetera? And kind of wrapped in that question is a lot of Westerners, at least, you know, they think, well, you know, the, the 21st century might become the, the, the century of China's ascension, where China becomes the leading superpower eventually of, of this century. Do you think it, it truly has the ability to play that role? Or do you think that it, its own challenges and shortcomings uh, may prevent it from being able to grab that mantle? Uh, first of all, um... I don't think China wants to be the global superpower. They want a multilateral world, which they will be starting to create with the 
uh, new currency and trade relationships that they will uh, be forming very soon. And in fact, the final documentation of this new currency was due to come out by the end of this week. Things are happening quite rapidly. Wow, so we should actually have some clarity pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. But coming back to your question, um, I, I think that uh, China and Russia's new world is going to attract a lot of other countries who have been tired, if not frustrated, by the bullying activities that America has undertaken over the last 20 odd years. Don't have to mention you know, Middle East, etc. It would not surprise me if the Gulf countries don't put their toes into this new world. Okay, and that would be very interesting. And we're already seeing a little bit of that where given the way the talks with Iran have been going, uh, Saudi Arabia has been kind of given the US the cold shoulder relatively recently. So, so as the UAE. All right, so the, the, the tectonic plates of geopolitical alliances that have existed for the past several decades are shifting here shifting. now. All right, well, I wanna get into, um, you've talked about this, this Asia, new Asian currency block and hopefully we're gonna get more detail about that uh, within the week. Um, which, which, what I wanna dig into with you here is it sounds like you're saying you know, it's gonna be a weighted average of the currencies of the countries that are part of it, but there's going to be ties to the commodities that those countries produce. And so is this going to be kind of a, a first step and a return to some sort of commodity backed uh, currency? Uh, that's my take. I mean, I know no more than, than, than reading the communique, but that is certainly the take that I, that I came away with. All right, sorry to interrupt, but, but, but who, who's issuing this communique? Uh, the Eurasian Economic Group. All right, so it's the confederation of these Including countries. China, yeah. Okay, great. And, and I'm sure that other countries are looking at it very carefully. All right. And you may have said this earlier, but do we know when ballpark they're planning on introducing this new currency basket? No, we don't know, but we can guess. And the fact that the uh, directorate of the Euro Eurasian Economic Group which was they held a meeting earlier this month, said we want to have the final documentation for discussion by the end of March, rather suggests that there is some urgency. So sooner rather than later is the best we yeah. can tell right now. Yeah. So there's a lot of discussion we've had on this channel in the past about uh, the role of precious metals. Um, most of the time, we sort of talk about talk about them as a as a wealth preserver, um, but from time to time, you know, the the discussion of the long term potential demise of sort of all fiat currencies, or at least their trend to devalue over time. Um, do you? I'm asking you to speculate here, but do you? Does this open the door to? Um, to gold being re-monetized? And, and I guess maybe a higher level question after you answer that, which is just, you're a metals guy. Which, what's your outlook on the precious metals right now? Um, I think there's a risk that short term, we have a sharp fall, short term. But if you're looking a year out, higher, higher uh, um, gold prices. And I think there is, if I read between the lines of the Eurasian um, communique, I think the new block is actually bringing gold back into the, into the system. 
All right, and I know you're which a top be, brand. Which obviously would be extremely attractive for Gulf countries. Okay, so I, I know you're, you're a copper analyst and not a gold analyst, but do you have sort of a ballpark sense of if indeed gold begins to become re-monetized, uh, what could that do to the price of gold? What, what do you think would happen to the price of gold? Um, because there's, there's, as we know it so far, I think there's only like $7 trillion worth of, of gold above ground, and most of that's in central bank uh, vaults. Um, do, do you think that a, a modernization well, would, would, well, as, would have an immediate I've impact said, one way or the other? China and Russia own much more than is being published. I mean, I can give you a simple example of China's ownership. Please do. A friend, a friend of mine, I better not uh, state from what country, but um, his company had a lot of revenue and earnings arising from their operations in China. And he got to know a lot of people. One being a senior officer of the PLA who invited him down to drinks one afternoon. We started at four o'clock and at six o'clock he was tapped on the shoulder and said, let's go for a walk. So they went to this large warehouse. The doors opened and as he said to me, my jaw dropped because they're stacked from <coughs> floor to ceiling with bars of gold. So basically what the PBOC holds is only a small part of what the government and the government agencies own. And then on top of that, you've got, as Alistair MacLeod uh, has reported, uh, you, you have something like 17,000 tons of gold that the public have physically bought from the Shanghai Gold Exchange. All right, so you know China has been, sounds like you're saying China's, um, well, you said earlier, China's sort of been preparing um, I think for multiple changes to the current yeah. trade system and world order. Um, I, I guess my question to you is, do you feel that this, I'll call it stockpiling of, of much more gold than perhaps the world is aware of, do you think that's part of the plan? Meaning uh, at some point they want to be less dependent on the dollar and they'll put that gold to use in some way, maybe as part of a, a gold-backed currency? Uh, to answer the question a different way, uh, there is a new policy, which is to stockpile anything of substance that we import, whether it's agricultural products or whether it's commodities or metals. So this is interesting, leads into the current situation with Russia, because what we will see is very quietly, China buying what Russia cannot sell to the rest of the world. It will come in through the unreported channels into China. All right, and I would think China would be happy about that because that seems to be consistent with the strategy Absolutely. you've been describing. Absolutely. Yeah, it, 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 and what they've been doing, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna find a little uh, cartoon <laughs> that Axel Merck's company has, has uh, created where it shows basically um, currency war between the US and China where we're throwing gold bricks at China and they're throwing our dollars back at us. And, and the, the, the gold bricks are stacking up in China and dollars are stacking back up in the US. And it says, hey, who's really winning this game, right? So, <laughs> so China has been very focused as you're saying, uh, and look, you understand this way more than me. So correct me if I'm wrong in any of my statements here. Um, but China has been taking the dollars, that the, the surplus dollars that they've had from their trade surplus with the US 
And it sounds like they've been buying gold with it. Uh, it's been one of the things they've done, but they've also been, you know, around the world, locking in ownership of key hard assets, you know, mines, ports, Correct. Correct. Uh, you know, farmland, et cetera. Um, so, you know, one may say that they're being very intelligent and planning for the future, right? They're And they're trading infinitely printable fiat for... Yeah, for hard you know, assets. Finite yeah. hard assets Absolutely. that we actually need to, to right? Yeah. So so they're happy to basically turn around and and, and buy more from Russia, uh, yeah. maybe even potentially yeah. in the short term at a discount. Russia might be offering them a good deal because it can't yeah, sure. access some of the other markets it could. Okay, so it sounds like you're, you're agreeing. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, so this gets into kind of a, a territory that, that I, I do talk an awful lot about, which is... Um, Growing resource scarcity, um, you know, uh, some people call it a Malthusian outlook on, 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 you know, the global situation. And I don't mean to imply that, that we're running out of, you know, essential resources tomorrow, but um, I'll just talk about oil for a moment. Um, you know, there's the concept of peak cheap oil. I've had several experts on this program relatively recently who understand, uh, petroleum geology much better than I, who basically corroborate this, which is just saying that, that we've largely, as a species, taken all the cheap, easy stuff out of the planet, at least that we're aware of to date, and that going forward, supplies are going to become more expensive to extract, they're going to be in tougher places to get, and just it's going to require more energy and therefore more cost to extract them. And oil is super important because Kind of the world still runs on fossil energy, but you can apply that to, to really almost kind of any material that gets pulled out of the earth here. Um, and my sense is, is that as uh, the world wakes up to that, uh, it's going to start putting a lot of pressure on um, these, the, the cooperation that has emerged post-World War II amongst many uh, nations around the world. It's, it's been a wonderful period of tranquility and, and cooperation. But as, as key resources begin to become scarcer, I think it's going to be a little bit more like every country for itself. And, and you're already sort of saying that China and Russia and some of these BRIC companies are, are already you know, beginning to say, yeah, you know, we, we, we want to start locking in more of this stuff for ourselves. We don't want you know, a big player like the US to be able to kind of dictate what happens uh, with you know, these key resources, like the way that you know, the US has basically made oil have to depend on the petrodollar, right? So do, do you see kind of looking forward the next couple of decades, the primacy of access to natural resources becoming a more important part about how the world works? <clears throat> Let's talk about copper. Don't click away just yet, folks. I have an important ask of you. But first, our interview with Simon will continue over in part two, which will be released tomorrow as soon as we're finished editing it. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And this brings me to my ask. At the time I'm filming this, this Wealthy on YouTube channel is about to celebrate its one year anniversary. And we're currently at 98,000 subscribers. I would really appreciate it if you can help us hit 100,000 subscribers by our anniversary date next month. We've built a really special and I think rare community of like-minded, critically thinking, prudent investors at this channel. And hitting the 100,000 subscriber strong mark will be good validation to everyone that this important movement we've started is reaching critical mass. So if you're watching this video and haven't subscribed yet, please do hit that red subscribe button now. Oh, and also hit the like button while you're down there too. Last, if the turbulent outlook that Simon detailed in this interview has you feeling a little vulnerable about the prospects for your portfolio, then consider scheduling a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your portfolio, keeping in mind the risks and trends that Simon mentioned here. Just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. All right. Thanks for hitting that subscribe button, and I'll see you next in part two of our video interview with Simon Hunt.